Hey, James, what's up? What's up? What's your uh, backstory and some of the some of the things you went through in the early days, kind of leading up to um, being interested in music? You know, the area you grew up in. I am from originally born and raised in San Francisco. My father had a lot to do with my musical progression because it always progressed. And I started out, uh, you know, I'm born in 1959, so that makes me like 64 right now. I was always two or three years older than most of, uh, of these bands that we'll talk about later. So I've always been a little bit older than most of them, and uh, that's good and bad, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so my father was an, was an attorney, and he was a very hip lawyer, criminal law attorney and he was very hip so he always listened to uh in the 70s i was listening to lots of the 70s music and there was a, a radio station around here called ksan which only played like the newest and you know the 70s type of thing and then they'd even have like a drug report every friday and tell you what kind of weed and stuff was in town <laughs> but it was very uh, hip channel and and his album collection, I would just go through it and decide what I, you know, of course, like Dark Side of the Moon, Journey's first album, Peter Frampton, uh, Layla album with Eric Clapton. I could go on. But my dad set my fundamental, uh, which was even more advanced than uh, my friends at the time, because they weren't all into that when I was like in grammar school. But uh, I think the first album I ever bought was Cosmos Factory from Creedus Clearwater Revival. Now, I'm going back, and that's dating me, but, you know, when that came out, I bought it. Oh, so yeah, that's as yeah. far back as I go. And I know you can relate, James, because music has a lot to do in the early earlier periods of your life. It shapes you for oh, yeah. later. Yeah, definitely. I always say this, and and I know you're going to relate to this. You know, you, you, you go through school, and you go through high school, and you get out in your early 20s, and it seems like all my friends, like whatever, uh, when I graduated 78, and by the time 1980 hit around, nobody was uh, progressing. Everybody was listening to the classic, what we now call classic rock, classic metal, but they weren't really doing anything beyond that. There was no extreme. So that's where uh, my musical direction kind of branched out, and it, uh, and it got... And it got heavier. You know, I always strove to go a little heavier, a little heavier. And before yeah. you know it, yeah. um, a new style of music was taken off in the Bay Area. And at first, I didn't even know that it was taken off. You know, I I, uh, I go back to some of my first uh, bands that I started to know. Like the first band I really got to know was a band called Hades that Mike Moreno and Brian Poole they had kind of mm. gone through and it was like god it was like i i call uh mike moreno the tony iomi of the bay area because he had a very established song a sounding band and uh he played an sg just like tony and a lot of influence there so i got to know them and then through them and playing these little gigs that they'd play like opening up for other bands and then you start realizing wow there's mm. other bands like them and they're a little faster, and there was Monolith, and, uh, uh, you know, there was Warning SF, and I met John Torres very early on. I remember after seeing him play, I had to go up to him and say, hey, John, man, you are a phenomenal guitar player. And uh, that was his band, and he later went on to Ulysses Siren, and um, and then I put him in Law's Rocket, and he was in Heathen, he was in quite quite a few bands before his untimely demise. He uh, died uh, of a freak kind of accident, fall down the stairs, and went into a coma. But that's another story. So, <clears throat> so John Torres was a good friend of mine. And when you start out and you start branching out, there are these bands that are playing, and you get to know the people back here. That became the foundation of the scene which most of the thrash bands back then said they were from San Francisco, but they were actually from the East Bay, most of them. But, you know, if you said you were from Hayward, nobody uh, other than people in the Bay Area would know where that is. So that was the reason everyone was saying they were from San Francisco back in the early days. 
and a lot of the bands uh, that I knew were like the opening bands, and then I'd go see other bands. But it all led me down a path where this extreme music and this new type of metal was coming out. And I think the first band that really, really influenced me to go that way was Lost Rocket. And around here, Lost Rocket was well known as to coming out, and they were, you know, bands like Metallica were coming up here and they were opening for them. So they were a very popular band when they first started out because it was like, it was like, if you like Judas Priest, then they took it another step above that. And I think that they're one of the first bands that had that kind of uh, dual guitar players and a double bass, Victor Angela. He kind of, uh, I think in the area, he was one of the first to use a double bass and uh, what I liked back then was Michael Coons and a and a real singer, and um, and Aaron Jellum and Phil Kentner, great guitar duo, one of the best uh, of the Bay Area, and they're very underrated. So back then, there were, they could play a show and it would sell out, and and then they could play two shows at the Stone on a Friday and Saturday night and sell both of them out and have lines around the block, which at the time I thought was incredible. So I'll I'll tell you the first uh, one of the first times I saw Laws Rocket, they were playing the sold out night at, at the Stone, and I came with my girlfriend, and I was like blown away by their music, by the whole pyro and just the whole the whole crowd and everything. And I was I, I remember whispering to my girlfriend after they played, I go, man, those guys are so good. I'm gonna get to know those guys. I'm gonna get to know them, and. Uh, and sure enough, that's what landed up happening. And uh, like I said, Lost Rocket, one of my first uh, major influences and one of the godfathers of the whole thrash metal scene in my mind. There are other bands that have done it better and have, have uh, come out with a bigger pow factor. But at the time, there was nothing else. And every, you know, they were, I thought they were on their way to big and glorious things. You know, I remember seeing Iron Maiden for the first time I ever saw him was at a day on the green. Um, you know, uh, I'll never forget that. A day on, if day on the greens and the barrier are legendary. There's like a, they play oh, with yeah. the eight play outdoors. It's a stadium and it's full. Even the, the ground of the infield is full of people. So there's lots and lots of people. I remember I caught, uh, nobody knew who Iron Maiden was and they were opening. I went right up front and, um, I think during that show, I caught Dave Murray's pick that I still have, one of the first guitar picks that I got oh, yeah. way you back. Got, you got quite the collection of guitar picks. You sent me some pictures, and it's it's just books and books and books. That's that must be a lot of memories there. Yeah, you try. You know, the memories are from the early days of me getting them and not knowing anybody and fighting my way up there and fighting for these uh, guitar picks. Yeah, I used to do that and drumsticks. And all that, and then more back then. But after, you know, we're talking years later, then I started working for bands, and then it's not like, you know, not so much fighting for them. Well, today I still fight for them. But back then, I would, uh, you know, when you start working for bands, then then they start giving them to you, and other bands give them to you if you have them. So it's like not a big deal. But yeah, I've always I've always liked that. But anyway, from Lost Rocket, um, I started uh, hanging out with them and partying them, and and they actually uh, were from Berkeley, uh, a couple of them, and so we'd hang out, and that's how um, through them and everything I found out about Ruthies and about um, the East Bay scene and more concerts and going out of San Francisco, like the Keystone, Berkeley, and a lot of other places, you know, and at that time. You know, Y&T was was kind of big around here, but underground. And, you know, it was a uh, it was a fun time because everything was just shaping. But I would say that the earth mover of the of the movement was Metallica. And yeah, uh, yeah. And, and and right along in their footsteps was Exodus. And they kind of missed oh, yeah. them because yeah. they took so long to put out their second album. Everybody always wonders if Bonded by Blood <laughs> was really. And they came out with a follow-up right after that they would have uh, took off just like Metallica. And I've always wondered about that. You go back to like Back to the Future 2 and what it would uh, what it could have been. 
Yeah, because anyway, um, the yeah the one the one yeah because there's a there was a time gap, but I think that had more to do with uh, Paul Bailoff being out and Zetro getting in, right? Yeah, the, the the way I understand it, and of course, you know, everyone's got different stories, but the way I understood it is that the band wanted the label wanted a more uh, a singer than uh, more of a singing type of a singer. And Paul was a unique person, but Paul also had his inner demons. So he wasn't as responsible as uh, people would have liked back then. And that was another, another thing in his uh, drinking and drug problems, which later manifested. But um, yeah, they, they took a little, uh, you know, they decided to move on from singer and they got uh, Steve Zetro Souza and um, probably lost rock. had something to do with, uh, with me finding out about legacy and then going to a show and, uh, and meeting Steve for the first time on the first time I ever saw legacy and, uh, it, legacy became like, like lost rocket. One of the bands that I would just go to shows wherever they played the river theater, they played and they played Ruthie's and stuff like that. And always, uh, again, they were just, you know, ahead of their time, but you know what I'm saying? So, Exodus, with that misstep, other bands stepped in, and I think Megadeth and Anthrax and Slayer even uh, got the upper hand on because they they didn't have these things. They didn't have a lineup change. They, uh, you know, th- I'd like to say the first album for a lot of bands is is easier because you've been playing these songs so much that it yeah, yeah. becomes nature. But then when you have some success, boy, that sophomore album is a lot more thought of and a lot more deep to the musicians you know to to have a follow-up that's worthy of their initial release and that goes with everybody right yeah yeah because i think um at least from if you look at any band's catalog i say like maybe the first three to four albums are when they're probably the most strongest and then they might branch off or experiment on other things but yeah as far as the writing, as long as the same people are involved, you do get the core of that, still that writing style, but then, you know, like I said, some of them do actually go in different directions. You know, over this long period of time, since we're talking about the early days of Metallica and where Metallica is today, um, yeah, that uh, they can do what they want to do because that's how big they are. But everybody prefers the first three to four albums. Yeah. And then there's a big drop off. And I think that time has a lot to do with it because a lot of bands aren't around for as long as them. And, uh, and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger until they're the biggest band in the world, which is kind of incredible. I'd like to say, I know most of those guys, uh, when they moved here, um, at least James and Lars seeing them around and, um, you know, they were, uh, I don't think they had two nickels to their name back then, right? They lived, yeah. uh, they were just uh, like any other band. That's the whole thing. They were like any other band that wasn't really, didn't have a record, was playing San Francisco in this new style of uh, a little heavier music. And uh, I can still remember having that tape before the album came down, like their demo or whatever, and playing it. And I would go down to Los Angeles and I would, play it to my cousin Arthur who uh, was in the same type of music I was except there was a whole nother scene down in Los Angeles and that was what was great was that back then I would fly down to LA on a a midnight flight and it was $25 PSA you wait in line no buying tickets in advance just wait in line and board the mail plane and you were $25 you were in LA I'd rent a car and pick up my cousin and we'd see all sorts of bands i saw slayer uh when they were wearing makeup and playing the woodstock and they were they were opening for bitch and (laughs) other bands like august red moon and tyrant and um lizzie borden there were there there was a whole nother scene odin i could name a lot of bands because i would fly down quite a lot because i didn't work back then and i would just uh music was what i did so i would uh, fly down there and see all these bands that nobody even knew about in the bay area yet but when they started putting out albums that's how everything kind of 
got put together and uh, Metallica breaking the doors down for everybody else because once that album got popular, it just made everybody that was even associated with the Bay Area and that scene, you know, they would at least get an album and uh, that's how it took off from there. But that's one thing I'd like to say is that uh, it's a special time in the Bay Area in this infancy of thrash metal and back then it wasn't thrash metal because they didn't have a word for it back then we called it speed metal yeah i remember I mean, yeah because back when i first got into it it was uh because i remember getting like the, um the early metallica stuff and some of the early exodus stuff and then dark angel they always called it speed metal yep and yeah. that's how you know it was fast and that's the way it was meant to be played and it was just uh jaw dropping like i said most of the guys I went to school, I'm in my early 20s, and to them, listening to a Metallica album was crazy to them. You know, they couldn't get into it. So in my early 20s, I kind of like, you know, I split off from my high school friends. You know, I grew up in the Sunset District in San Francisco, and uh, I, I split off from them because I'd found this whole other group of friends that I could go and on weekends there were shows and during the week there were shows as the popularity grew, you could go to a show every night of the week if you wanted to at the stone. And I got to meet a lot of the musicians um, later. Like I remember meeting uh, Ted Aguilar and Will Carroll before they were in Death Angel. They were in a band called Warfare DC and they always mm -hmm. played around. And uh, gee, I think Ted must've been like 15 years old at the time. But um you know, so all these guys, it's it's kind of a, we have a special thing here in the Bay Area. I don't think anybody realizes it, but it's like, you know, when you're, when you go back to a high school reunion after 20 years, you have that kind of camaraderie because you went to high school with these guys. But with us, it was, we've known the same group of inner core friends and in the scene for the last 35 years. So it even goes deeper than high school because you've, You've known these guys since they were young, and now you're old men. But you go to these uh, shows, and no matter when you go, uh, you see people that you know, and you have this uh, inner group, and we call them old school here. And uh, people have been around since the beginning, and then and, and that group of friends. So when you go to a concert, you don't even have to go with with somebody if you're uh, like me. You just you just go, and and when you walk in the door. You, you see people you know, you start talking, the next thing you know, the conversations are endless. It's it's even more fun sometimes back then at the Omni and the Stone to try to go away from the music and just uh, interact and talk and make friends and have a few drinks. So that's, that's what happened here. The Bay Area became a whole scene, Exodus, and uh, we're, we're, you know... That, that album, I remember seeing the record release party at the Kabuki for Exodus. Uh, now we'll fast forward all of a sudden to just like maybe five, seven years ago. And um, of course, you know, I do the Toxic Vault with Zetro. Oh, yeah. So I came to Steve and I had an idea. I said, you know, um, maybe we could take this. Uh, the last time you played Ruthie's, this tape that I have, and we make a live CD out of it. And sure enough, I gave it to him, and he had some guy that he knew that digitalized it because, you know, this is back when I didn't know how to do it, but simple. They did that, and then Zetro uh, put the uh, four the four songs off the demo I th that he did with uh, Legacy. It was like the biggest selling demo of all time at that time so this was a pretty big demo and he put that on this live version i don't know if you've ever heard of it it's called the zetro years it was never released it's uh it's called the zetro years and it's got the the ruthies live on it and the and the demo like i said you can, it's not an official release it was more like zetro made it and sometimes when you see him at an appearance he might have a, a few copies whatever he doesn't want to do anything that'll piss off the testament guys using their music but you know as we all know steve uh was legacy it was his band which yeah. is unlike him in today's band because gary holt runs exodus but back at that time uh zetro ran a legacy and and actually made the choice to leave legacy 
to be in Exodus, which was bigger at the time. But uh, an, another other people kind of wonder if that decision, just think if Zetro never leaves legacy and what happens, mm. you know. But everything happens for a reason, and you get Chuck Billy that Zetro actually um, recommended for the job, and he actually uh, tutored him to show him how to sing this new style of music because it was different than what Chuck was doing at the time in another band called Guilt, which was also playing the Stone, which I did see. I seen I, I've seen them once. I know. Don't remember. I saw them though, and I have a guitar pick. That's how I know. <laughs> saw them, and it says Guilt on it. <laughs> and I don't even have the guitar player's name. So it's a white Fender, but I, I know I seen them back then. Yeah, that was but, more of a glam band, right? Yeah, he came from a, a glam band. And a lot of these bands that started out, you know, uh, and you look back at old pictures of Slayer, and they own the godfathers of thrash metal can only have themselves to look at and be influential. So, like, the guys the Slayer are wearing... Um, spandex yeah. and you know, the Exodus they're wearing spandex <laughs> and uh, I think the Bay Area though came up with the idea of just not wearing anything yeah and, street clothes right and like I said I'd seen uh, Slayer do their thing very early in their career so I, I, I thought it was kind of cool and you know it was very uh, you know in LA all those bands uh, dress up it's a little more flamboyant and that's uh, you know but not here in the Bay Area, and that was from early on. And I think a lot of, uh, in fact, I think Slayer stopped wearing uh, makeup because when they came to the Bay Area, it wasn't received too well. I remember people... Yeah, yeah. I, heard the, I heard the stories, yeah. But, of course, they had not gotten the name yet. And uh, they knew that if they came up here, you know, put on some jeans and a t-shirt and play. And I yeah. think that's how they evolved. I could be wrong, but that's my, that's what I think. And so now let's, uh, so now you have these bands that are breaking out and I'm going to more and more and more shows, you know, and at the time I worked as, uh, I worked for Bill Graham presents as a security guard at Wolfgang's, the Kabuki, um, the Warfield, the Fillmore, and that's how you get to, to see the inner workings of everything. And um, I even remember once when uh, Accept played the Kabuki, they needed, they didn't have a drum tech for Accept, and the drummer needed help. So they said, hey, go help that drummer. So I literally helped uh, <laughs> Stephen Kaufman set up his drums and hand them to him, and he put them, do them himself. And uh, I'll never forget, he gave me a a nice pair of drumsticks that I still have to this day, but that was like during the mental metal health, right? Was that that album? What was that called? Um, um, what was um, that? Metal, metal heart. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Right. So go way back and accept and, you know, seeing loudness back there, all sorts of bands at the Kabuki along with LD Miola and all these other, other things. So I was influenced a lot and that's how I even met more people and one of my friends that I grew up with in the sense that his name was Mike Kanzler. And you might know him because if you really know about Exodus, on the Pleasures of the Flesh album, there's a cannibal on the back of the album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's Mike Kanzler. And he landed up getting a job with them uh, because you need Tony Isabel, who is a female manager that worked for BGP, but Exodus was her, her band, and she got... Uh, Exodus some good gigs and I think that's really helped them a lot was Tony and uh, to break out because they were highly underground I mean you, you know you just don't go see Slayer and every and, and millions of people are there I mean it starts from somewhere and it's oh, yeah. always you know it's always small how it starts out but that's how Exodus was and they had a great manager she got them a lot of important gigs and Mike Kanzler was uh, asked to to go on the road. He's like a production manager or something. So anyway, this is before the album's released during the time that they just recorded it. Anyway, they were my favorite band at the time because of bonded by blood. And I was so into Exodus that, uh, they could do no harm. And I was waiting cause I knew Zetro and I wanted to see this new sound with Exodus and pleasures to come out. And I remember, uh, one day I, I came home, 
or whatever. I went over to Mike's house and Mike says, hey, he goes, do you know how to drive a truck? I go, yeah, I know how to drive a truck. He yeah. goes, well, you know, Exodus, they need uh, an equipment truck driver. Can you do that? I said, yeah, I, I can. Um, and I might have overstepped, you know, I'm, you know, you don't realize what you're saying, saying at the time, you yeah. just want to do it. And, you know, I didn't know that, uh, by truck, they meant, uh, the largest truck you could rent at Ryder. <laughs> and, uh, and, and back then, you know, you just don't put it in, in drive. You had, yeah. uh, shift gears. It was oh, yeah. a different scene back in 1987 technology wise. Yep. And, um, so I said yes. And that's how I got a job. Um, my first time with a band going on tour in 1987 and it was it was anthrax among the living tour exodus pleasure of the flesh and celtic frost and i think what was the album back then into the pandemonium somewhere around there i might be wrong but it was uh, early celtic not early early but yeah. early celtic frost and which was at the time i was like man um I've never really got into Celtic Frost, but by the end of that tour, they were great. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so that's that. How I I started working for Exodus. I'll I'll tell you about this. This tour had a lot to do with a lot of highs, a lot of lows, and ultimately failure. And like a phoenix coming out of the out of the ground out of the burnt ground of phoenix rises and that's how uh, i consider that time period which i'll tell you about so okay so now i'm working for exodus and right away i'm going to like the practice before they're going on tour and they're rehearsing and uh, the week before the tour so i go to practice and then uh the Kanzer had bought this video camera. And back then, video cameras were very big, very expensive, and uh, like a monster thing that would fit on your shoulder, like the old, like nowadays the TV crews kind of use. It's kind of yeah. a, was a, not too huge, like the that style, but it was big, big enough where it was clumsy and bulky. But uh, it shot uh, VHS tapes. You put a, a blank VHS vhs tape in it yeah. and it would shoot now i never had done that before because this is a new thing that came out but i've always enjoyed taking pictures so i started so i, I even think i did a a video of them in practice that's somewhere i don't even know it was but before we left i was versed with the camera so okay so that comes along later but let's now go to the drive <clears throat> so i remember i had a uh, one crew member arrived with me and we got the gear. I think it was Kanzler. And and we drove down. The first show was Exodus. Going to headline Fender's Ballroom. Legendary place in L.A., right? So we get down there. I park the, the truck. A non-eventful drive. Beautiful. Because I-5 is easy. And you come down to L.A. And I remember it was in the afternoon I had gotten there. And uh, so I stepped... So I stepped, walk into the tour bus, all the guys are there laughing and da, 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 da. And, and I noticed that there was these, these lines of what I thought was like Coke or something on a, on the table there, you know, and they were pretty big lines. And I remember, uh, Gary, uh, laughing and like, Oh, Walter, come on over here. And, uh, you do one of these big you know gacker lines or whatever and, and i was like you know i uh and i said well i i never really done the speed before you know and you know what they call crank nowadays everyone else is doing it so of course which you know i did i did one line but the line was like not a small little one like normal people do it was <laughs> like in these guys <laughs> You know, they were pretty big, so yeah, I did this. Professional, and, we're professional drug drug users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, so that was the first night. So, I, of course, you know, it was the afternoon. I never went to sleep. And then the next drive is Phoenix, and I drive to Phoenix, and I get my hotel room, and I can't sleep. But then I go to the show. After the show, I drive 
from there, another long, another long drive to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, I was feeling a little tired by then. I thought I was tired. So I go to my hotel room and I couldn't sleep. And I stayed up the, the entire night again. And I've already been up like, you know, two nights and this and that. And then the, I'll never forget because the drive, you know, you're on a schedule here. You cannot be late. You have to show up the gear or the show doesn't go on. 18-hour drive, I forget. i just doing it from memory, but Albuquerque to Corpus Christi, Texas. So I remember arriving there, and it was hot and sweaty. I arrived to this big hotel, nice hotel. And uh, I am just like, I don't even know how, you know, I was delirious, but I made it. No incidents or nothing. And I was just, it, it had been like four days by now or something, right? So I... Uh, <laughs> Got it. I, I got to sleep. I got it. Or I, I just can't continue on. I got it. So uh, I got to my room and I'll never forget. Uh, I called down to the desk and I um, said, can I order some room service? And they go, yeah, what do you want? And I go, I want a fifth of Jack Daniels and I want two Cokes in cans. Yeah, and uh, kind of to put you out. Yeah, right? I can't even remember <laughs> how I ordered that, but whatever it was, I was willing to pay for it, get it. And, you know, I had to do, I, I remember opening the bottle and just guzzling some of it to get the edge off. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. And, uh, and the next thing you know, I slept. But I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, I slept. It was all good. I got enough rest and everything. But I never recovered from that for the rest of the whole tour. I, was, I never recovered because I was always felt sleep deprived or tired. <laughs> it, it took something out of me. And when you're not used to doing something like that, that's a, <laughs> that, that happens, I guess. Oh yeah, you know? oh, yeah and I, definitely. Yeah, I've never done any more or want to do any, I call it nightmare because it was like a nightmare to me.